In June 1953, in a ritual dating back 900 years, the Queen was crowned. As the years passed by, her young family often took second place to the demands of their mother's job. Royal weddings came and went. Marriages were dissolved. Royal homes in flame. In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. Royal children tragically lose their mother. And a new woman arrives. This is the story of the life of a woman whose birthright was to be queen. Following the terrorist attacks in America, the Queen attends a special service of remembrance at St. Paul's Cathedral. Before a congregation united in grief for the 3,000 victims, a candle is lit and thoughts turn to grieving families. At a more cheerful occasion, the Queen with her mother and sister Margaret acknowledge the cheers as the Queen Mother celebrates her 100th birthday. A year later, the scene has changed. Now, Margaret can only raise her arm to acknowledge the birthday crowd. From her wheelchair, a lifetime flashes before her, back to happier days when she and her sister were part of the royal family firm under the watchful eye of their adoring parents. They were very tight-knit. They did a lot of things together. And, of course, uh, King George VI absolutely doted on his youngest daughter, Princess Margaret, who was cheeky and naughty and beautiful. And Princess Elizabeth was more studious, and, uh, and he loved her too, but it was Margaret's sort of mischievousness that he adored and totally spoiled her. Trained by Queen Mary, the young Princess Elizabeth was very much like her grandmother. She didn't inherit her own mother's warmth um, and spontaneity. And the person she admires almost most, um, apart from Queen Victoria, is her grandmother, Queen Mary. And you can see a great resemblance between the two. You know, that uh, shyness, that formality, that slight distance from the public. Aboard HMS Vanguard, bound for South Africa, the young princesses were filmed with their mother and father during the long journey to Cape Town. It was 1947, the first royal trip to the empire since the war. It was also an opportunity for the young princess Elizabeth, heir to the throne, to pledge her life to the service of the monarchy. I declare before you all that my whole life whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Nearly 50 years later, after making that vow, the Queen returned to South Africa. She was welcomed to a country free from racial discrimination and a republic within the Commonwealth. Colour pictures of sleek people carriers replaced the old black and white fuzzy images of open saloon cars. She advanced through the cheering crowds on a journey to meet the president, Nelson Mandela, and to unveil a plaque commemorating her visit. In November 1947, Princess Elizabeth married Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten. On his wedding day, her husband-to-be was given the title Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Princess Elizabeth was 21 years old. Following the war years, the country was still in the grip of austerity. The government recommended a low-key wedding, but for millions, it was a long overdue chance for celebration. 
The wedding dress made of ivory satin was designed by royal dressmaker Norman Hartnell. It was the first joyful royal event there had been since the war. And Britain had been through very difficult times of uh, poverty, of people without homes after all the bombing of the cities. Uh, it was a very, very depressing time. And Churchill described the wedding as a bright ray of colour on the hard grey road we have to travel. On a cold November evening, the newlyweds arrived at Waterloo Station to board the royal train at the start of their honeymoon. Princess Elizabeth took along her favourite corgi, Susan. The young bride had met her husband eight years earlier. The Queen was 13 when she first saw Prince Philip, who was then a young naval cadet at Dartmouth, and very good looking. You know, every sort of schoolgirl's idea of a dashing hero, blonde, light, very sort of athletic. They then um, met um, some years later, and of course, we're so different then. A courtship was conducted perhaps at a distance, but uh, the Queen had met the man sh she loved, and uh, I would think has never stopped loving. Princess Elizabeth was a young naval officer's wife stationed in Malta with her husband. These were happy days for the young woman. For Princess Elizabeth, it was like um, flying out of a cage. After all, she'd been brought up during the war at Windsor Castle, very much isolated. And there in Malta, she just lived the life of any naval wife, going to dances, going to parties, going to beach parties, uh, just living a totally normal life. And it was perhaps the happiest period of her life. In November 1948, six days before her first wedding anniversary, Prince Charles was born at Buckingham Palace. Elizabeth wrote to a friend, I can't believe he's really mine. This particular boy's parents couldn't be more proud of him. She saw him as much as any families, any aristocratic families see their children in those days. I mean, she would see him in the morning and she would see him in the evening. Uh, and so she, she was able to, to have those first four formative years around him. Princess Anne was born two years later in 1950. At her christening, the young Charles shared his parents' enthusiasm for the new addition to the royal family. With the arrival of a little sister, the toddler Charles needed special attention. The Queen always had a soft spot for her firstborn, the, the boy child, and Anne was very naughty and therefore not quite so endearing as Prince Charles. He was very sweet, very loving and just adorable. In fact, his grandfather said, we love him just tumbling round the room. In 1952, the sick King George said goodbye to his daughter at Heathrow Airport. She was on a state visit, going to visit Australia and New Zealand. When she stopped off in Kenya, and it was there that she heard that her father died. A black cloud of grief descended on the nation when it learned of the loss of its king. But while the old king was being mourned, the new queen's reign had begun. The death of her father had a huge impact on her because suddenly her young marriage, her young children were all but taken away from her. She was queen. She had specific duties which she had to do which really left her very little time to see her children. The young children watched as their mother left Buckingham Palace in the gold state coach for her coronation at Westminster Abbey. Later, they joined her on the balcony to acknowledge the crowds. People were optimistic in the way that they thought oh, this is going to be a new Britain with a young queen. And then on the day of the coronation came the news that Hillary and Tensing had conquered Everest. And this was another terrific morale booster. Official duties meant long absences away from home for the young queen. On one occasion, her son hardly recognized his mother. Being a young member of the royal family had its compensations. Occasionally, Charles and Anne would join their parents on trips abroad. 
So we have to remember that um, Prince Charles and Princess Anne were born before she came to the throne, when she was still just the heir to the throne. And so she had more time, she had a more private life. As soon as she acceded to the throne, she had so much to do, so much to learn, huge Commonwealth tours to do, which in those days, before jet planes had really caught on, took months. The steam train allowed the young family to spend more time together. A special royal children's nursery coach was hitched up to the royal train, allowing the young children to travel in comfort with their parents. It was the great age of the train. They traveled everywhere by train. And there was a special nursery coach for Prince Charles and Princess Anne and their two nannies and their detectives and their footmen. And it was all fitted out beautifully. The luxury of royal nursery life soon gave way to the realities of education for Prince Charles. As a young boy, his own father had been sent away to a tough school with a Spartan regime. And so it was to Gordonston in Scotland that Philip sent his son. He is very much a boss in the home. Um, he was the man who, he was the one who decided that the boy should go to Gordonston, whereas the queen herself might have preferred Eton. She took her eye off her son. I think that um, she listened to her husband and said, look, I think it's a good idea if he goes away to a boarding school. I'm not sure in retrospect that that was such a good idea, but then we'll never really know how Prince Charles would have turned out if he'd been to a sort of day school or had, had governors. It's very, very hard to tell. But I think Philip was very harsh on Prince Charles. We know that this has not been an immense success and the poor Prince Charles was deeply unhappy there. But I think the Queen felt particularly um, that in her marriage it should be a traditional marriage of her time. Which, in which the husband called the shots and the women ran the house. And also I feel that she had to compensate, felt that she had to compensate for the fact that she was, in essence, the boss and this dominant um, male, macho man that the Duke of Edinburgh had to take second place in public anyway. In February 1960, Prince Andrew was born almost 10 years after Princess Anne. So why the gap between their second and third child? She was just too busy. I think the Duke of Edinburgh thought that um, two children were probably enough. They had, after all, a boy and a girl. That was enough to ensure the succession. But then I think as the Queen, like many of us, at a certain age becomes a little broody and thinks how nice to have a baby and, and that's what happened. Once you have one baby, you ought to have another to keep her company. <laughs> At their first meeting, the teenage Princess Elizabeth confided in a friend that she never took her eyes off Philip. How have things changed since then? The Queen will call Prince Philip darling, but if she's in public or she's cross with him, she'll call him Philip. And one knows then that things are not, are a little glacial. And uh, the Queen is not the sort of person to lose her temper. Um, I think if there's a, a blistering row about something, she will probably go out and ride her horses or go and feed the dogs or um, groom the corgis. And he may stomp about a bit. But the Queen, her voice is not raised loudly, but everyone is aware if she is displeased and not amused. In 1977, the Queen celebrated her Silver Jubilee. The pageantry had not changed since her grandparents, King George V and Queen Mary, celebrated their Silver Jubilee along the same route in the same coach in 1935. More than 40 years later, the Gold State coach pulled up in front of St Paul's Cathedral. Since acceding to the throne 25 years ago, the Queen acknowledges the warmth from the crowd in a manner unbeknown to her royal ancestors. The royal walkabout is now part of royal duties. She comes from an era when it was not done for those people to be demonstrative in public. And sometimes she said after a day of meeting people, you know, I simply ache with smiling, 
but as confided, it's a sad thing. She doesn't have a smiley face. But where she was actually very touched and very natural was the time of the Silver Jubilee, going through the streets, and the people came out once again and shook her warmly by the hand, and she was astonished by this. I think she gets a lot of her shyness from Queen Mary, the same sort of uh, uprightness and inability, and yet it's so caring. Later, during the Silver Jubilee celebrations, the Queen paid tribute to her husband. In a speech at the Guildhall, she explained the real meaning of the royal we. We, and by that I mean both of us, are most grateful. <laughs> A 21-gun salute in Hyde Park to celebrate Prince Philip's 70th birthday culminated in an open carriage drive with the Queen. Prince Philip was born royal. He was the only son of Prince Andrew of Greece and his British-born wife, Alice. His royal heritage extended to the Queen's love for her pet corgis. This fine specimen is the granddaughter of Susan. She's the corgi who accompanied the newlyweds in 1947 on their honeymoon to Hampshire. The current pack of seven corgis is the tenth generation descended from Susan. The Queen is in the palace. She does give them afternoon tea herself. I mean, uh, she chops up their food and their biscuits and puts it down in little silver salvers. And some of them are quite snappy and are not averse to biting an ankle. And I sometimes think that gives her a very secret chuckle. After lunch at Windsor, and this is quite disconcerting for guests, uh, the Queen will spray dog biscuits around under the table. The footman appears with a salver, and on one occasion, the salver of dog biscuits was presented to the Queen, and a nervous bishop who was sitting beside her actually took one and ate it. In Windsor Great Park, the Queen watches Prince Philip enjoy one of his favourite pastimes, carriage driving. However, she is not amused when a crowd of nosy photographers get in her way. When Prince Philip gave up playing polo due to a bad back injury, carriage driving became a source of great satisfaction. Although the Queen lives in palaces and castles, she is a famously frugal person, despite owning private estates valued at £75 million. You will still find the Queen, perhaps with a small electric fire. I, th I think it may run to three bars, but uh, quite, and very often she'll put on two. But uh, she likes to be thrifty. And this is very sort of aristocratic in a way. But as I say, it's curious because the Queen Mother is not thrifty at all. And if you eat at Clarence's house, the food is lavish and whipped cream and wonderful salmon, wonderful beef, wonderful wine. Um, but the Queen is perhaps a little different. The Queen is custodian of many royal treasures. Her wealth is incalculable. She has in her possession a royal collection worth more than £10 billion. It's terribly hard to work out just how rich the Queen is. It's very hard to separate the goods, chattels, which are very valuable ones, that she is custodian of for her life. She you can't sell any of these things. So I don't think that should be included in her assets. The stamp collection of Buckingham Palace is worth millions. All the china, and she's got so many different sets of dinner sets, and whereas you or I might have, we, we consider ourselves like to have 20 set pieces, hers are most likely 450 set pieces of every item. She's most likely got 20 of those. Meissen, porcelain, all the great ones of the world. Now, 
Is that hers or is she just custodian? I think she's just custodian. Her art collection is just astonishing. There are so many Van Dykes around, there are Michelangelo's. I mean, absolutely endless goodies, but I'm not sure that she could classify them as being hers. I don't think she can. Certainly not the crown jewels, that's the state. But obviously this is an immensely rich woman. The Queen is an excellent horsewoman and enjoys a good canter in Windsor Great Park. She breeds her own horses from her studs in Norfolk and Hampshire. They are run on a commercial basis and all the profits are taxed. Every year in June, the royal family attends Ascot races. The Queen's passion for racing goes back to her father, who had a string of racehorses. An early victory for her was in 1952 at Glorious Goodwood. It was announced during the meeting that the Queen had leased the colt gay time from the national stud. So it was a fitting climax when, on the last day of the meeting, Gordon Richards, riding for the first time in the Queen's colours, rode gay time to victory in the Gordon Stakes. Horse racing has always given the Queen enormous pleasure. She has tremendous knowledge of horses and horsefish and breeding, but um, it's gone way back. And there's a little story which I think is just so lovely about her and about racing. She's very fond of her trainers. And years and years ago, there was a trainer called Captain Charles Moore, very old man, who was very, very ill. And she went to um, see him with the Queen Mother. And uh, she said, well, how are you, uh, Captain Moore? Well, Mum, he said, to tell the truth, he said, I feel like a rabbit that's just been bolted by a ferret. <laughs> she said, and turned to the Queen Mother. She said, well, I've been called many things behind my back before, but I've never been called a ferret to my face before. At the races, she expresses her emotions. You can see the sort of absolute girlish glee with which she treats them a win. She'll run done, you know, to get a better view and, uh, you know, her face lights up as you never see it light up on public occasions. This is when you see the Queen really excited, absolutely natural excited. You see her nudging the Queen Mother, whoever is beside her with binoculars up. Um, it's marvellous to see because this is, this is the Queen at play. She's very knowledgeable on the way horses are, be they race horses, two-year-olds in training, sprint horses, or whether they're driving carriages. Among the Queen's myriad of less well-known duties is her stewardship of the Duchy of Lancaster. Her huge land holding, which makes a substantial contribution to the monarchy's finances. As its landlady, the Queen pays the Duchy regular visits. Her tenants turn out delighted to see their Queen at close quarters. There is nothing which arouses more interest among her female tenants and their daughters than the choice of clothes the Queen makes for these visits to the Duchy. She has a very matter-of-fact attitude to clothes. She has always said, I'm not a film star. Um, the clothes, you know, are just essential to the job. And she has very strict rules. She will say to designers who will draw up some beautiful um, thing for a, a, a tour, and she'll say, hopeless for waving. I can't wave with uh, sleeves like that. So they must always ensure that she can wave. Hats must always be off the face um, because the people must be able to see me. And lipstick is always a very strong red. And this is for the sake of the photographers. And so that she can be seen by people from a great 
perfect distance. But she doesn't have a frivolous attitude to clothes, though she does like pretty bright colours. She likes um, lemons, pinks, blues, purples, although she looks very good, actually, in dark colours. On one occasion, she was wearing a very... She'd chosen a very pretty outfit for Fergie and Andrew's wedding. It was kind of bluey, bluey lilac-y and it had some kick cleats, and she was trying it on with her dressmaker. And Prince Philip walked in and he said, hmm, that's rather nice, Lilybird, and she flushed bright pink. So she does like to be praised, and she is, there is a feminine side to the Queen which perhaps we don't always see. Her hair is immovable, probably, in, in whatever the weather conditions. And I once said to her hairdresser, what is the secret of the Queen's hair? You know, why, why does it never move in the wind? And he said, brute force and lacquer. Elizabeth is Queen of 15 countries. Her Commonwealth is very dear to her. A lot of people don't appreciate this. They consider the Commonwealth as really very unimportant, a relic from the past. It's not how the Queen views it at all. She considers her role as um, Queen of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, any of the other 16 Dominion countries, she considers that every bit as important as being Queen of Britain, UK, Northern Ireland, Wales, all that, every bit as important. And she loves her prime ministers. The Commonwealth love her. They think that she's the person who cares about them, that the government of the day in Britain usually doesn't. And also, she's been around so long that all these, she's such friends with all these leaders. She knows their problems, she knows their families, she knows intimate details about them. I mean, you know, whether their brothers just died or something. So they really feel that she genuinely cares, and she does. As a world traveler, the Queen is often exposed to all the pitfalls of bad planning. During a visit to the United States, a speech at the White House resulted in some red faces. Some nitwit had got to the stand from, what she, from where she was reading her speech a little bit too high, and the camera was too low, and you just had a picture up over the lectern Onto, you couldn't see the Queen's face properly. All you could see was a hat, and everybody dubbed it as the speaking hat. Mm. She finds this actually immensely amusing. She has a great sense of humor. During a visit to Russia, the Queen entertained President Yeltsin and his wife. Receptions um, on the royal yacht. Um, drinks are very lavish indeed. And of course, uh, this loosens people's tongues. And she loves that. And she loves people to be natural. And I've been at some receptions abroad where people have perhaps relaxed a bit too much. And they start to tell her a story, which is terribly funny to the rest of us. Um, but you wonder, how is this going to go down? And she loves it. Um, she's very um, easily amused and makes people feel very good. Well, the Queen's friends will tell you what a wonderful sense of humour she has and how she finds... She likes to laugh at herself, for a start. And she loves ridiculous things. I mean, she'll laugh till the tears run down her face. And then she's got a quick wit, a sense of irony. I mean, there's a story I particularly like. And she was in a Norfolk shop, dressed as she normally is in the country, with her headscarf and everything. And a woman came up to her and said, um, I hope you don't mind my saying so, but you look awfully like the Queen. And the Queen said, how very reassuring. In 1981, Prince Charles set out to marry Lady Diana Spencer, the daughter of one of the Queen's equerries. It was heralded as a great step forward for the House of Windsor. I think the day that the Prince of Wales married Lady Diana Spencer was a great day for the Queen. What it was showing that day was that the continuity of her family was, con was being continued in a correct and proper manner. He was quite late when he married Prince Charles, you know. He was, he, he was old for a Prince of Wales to marry anybody. 
I think there was always a certain amount of concern about Diana, who was really quite young for her years. She was young anyway, but she was quite childlike, and I think there must have been a little bit of concern from the Queen on that. She'd come from a family who the Queen knew and respected. I mean, Diana's father, Earl Spencer, had been a query not only to herself, the Queen, but to her father, King George VI. And previous ancestors of the Spencers had served the royal family going back two or three centuries. So there was sort of good pedigree there. And although the Queen may have had one or two reservations, I mean, we'll never really know, she's so clever at hiding all her feelings, I think she was happy and satisfied that her son was marrying somebody and they would produce children and the, and the continuity of the House of Windsor would almost certainly keep going. The young Princess Diana was thrown into the public spotlight totally unprepared for the demanding nature of the job. The Queen must have known that there were all sorts of problems almost from the word go. So without us knowing, and she hid this very well, she was aware that Diana was having a, a, an incredibly difficult time settling down to married life. With the focus of attention now firmly on the new princess, Diana accompanied the Queen to the state opening of Parliament in 1984, unaware that her new hairstyle would overshadow the solemnity of the occasion. She had this incredible new hairstyle, and this very important, dignified occasion, which is all part of the process of being the, uh, the sovereign, the head of state, the opening of Parliament, was just blown out the window because all the newspapers and the televisions really concentrated on Diana's hairstyle rather than the solemnity of the occasion. Now this, I was told very close to the time, had really infuriated the Queen. She didn't mind Diana having a new haircut. That wasn't the point. The point was that by introducing it on the day of the opening of Parliament, she took all the emphasis away from the dignity of the occasion, and it all concentrated on Dan, and that was not very good for democracy and for the House of Windsor. In 1985, Prince Andrew, a naval officer, married Sarah Ferguson, a commoner. All the royal family turned out to welcome their new member. As a former naval officer's wife herself, the Queen could not understand why Sarah was so different to her. Their backgrounds are so very different from hers. After all, she'd grown up with it. She'd been used to Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle as a, as a child. She'd been trained for her job for forever. And so I don't think she fully understood the difficulties that these girls experienced. And I think when it came to um, the Duchess of York, particularly so, because for the Queen, her own naval days as a naval wife had been absolute joy to her. And the fact that Sarah Ferguson didn't, or the Duchess of York didn't seem to enjoy that aspect of her husband's life, she found very difficult to understand. The Queen did not fully appreciate the gulf between her and her daughters-in-law. Although differences were to develop later on, she obviously thought she'd done her best to protect them. If we look back, remember it was the Queen who called the editors to the palace in the early days uh, when the Princess of Wales uh, felt she was being pressurised by the press and the media. And uh, the Queen said, uh, you know, my daughter-in-law's peace must, must be protected. And she, at that time, moved to protect the Princess. Princess of Wales to her was like, an adorable skittish niece. I mean, she just knew Diana from childhood. Um, and so she was indulgent, caring, and a little bit bewildered sometimes. I mean, in the early days when the princess was married and they were at Balmoral and it was a stuffy occasion, princess would jump up from the table and run around the table and sit on Prince Charles's lap and give him a kiss. I mean, something like that had never been seen before amongst the royal family. And the queen would just shake her head and give a little smile. 
1993, the Queen attended the wedding of her nephew, Lord David Linley, at Westminster Abbey. There was a close bond between them and to David's sister, Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones. Their parents were married in 1960, and by the time their marriage was dissolved 18 years later, the Queen had become a very supportive aunt to her young niece and nephew, who spent many weekends and holidays with their Aunt Lilibet. She dotes on Princess Margaret's children, especially um, Lady Sarah, who is just a favorite niece. And she was a very sort of loving aunt figure and very proud of Lord Linley. I think one of the Queen's courtiers said to me that sometimes those young children thought the Queen was their mother because she would always take them up to Balmoral with her when um, Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden would go on their summer holidays to Sardinia or to um, Tuscany. And she was very much a stable figure in their lives, and she loved them very much. In 1989, the Duke and Duchess of York were with the Queen aboard Britannia with their new daughter, Princess Beatrice. As the couple's marriage broke down, the Queen confided in a friend about Sarah's behavior. I can't understand my children. Sarah didn't even try to be a naval wife, she said. By 1991, the Queen was aware that parts of her family were crumbling around her. There had already been a royal marital breakdown when Princess Anne and her husband Mark Phillips had split up after 15 years of marriage. The publication of Andrew Morton's book, Diana, Her True Story, ended any sympathy Queen Elizabeth might have had for Diana. These events focused attention on the Queen's relationship with her grandson. When Prince William was at Eton, the Queen saw a lot of him and got to know him quite well. She was concerned in the early years that she never saw them because Diana, in her Diana-ish way, sort of made a great thing of bringing the children to see the Queen, usually when she wanted something. So it wasn't always a natural happening and she didn't see very much of them, but then when William was at school, she saw a lot of him, but now sort of geography really keeps them apart. And William's, you know, his own man now, and he's at St Andrews, and he doesn't see that much of his grandmother. Harry sees, sees more of her because he's just over the road and he goes to Windsor Castle for tea. In public, William and Harry appeared at ease with their estranged parents. But the whole royal myth, which the Queen had tried so hard to build up, had started to unravel she found her son's behavior unsatisfactory. If Charles and Diana met each other after they'd both been married to someone else, it might have worked. Because there was a magic there, there really was. But I just, she was too young, and he was too emotionally young too. And he, he just had never met anyone like Diana who was so demanding. And she was so basically insecure that she needed love and attention all the time, which his role prevented him from giving her. The Queen had the highest hopes for Diana, and I think she, she rather liked the way that Diana was such a hands-on mother. She was almost envious of the fact that Diana could spend so much time with her children. But as the years went on and the, the cracks appeared in the marriage, I think she felt that Diana smothered rather than mothered her children. And she also disapproved strongly of Diana showing such emotion in, in front of her children Many stories of William pushing tissues under the bathroom door, Diana sobbing in the bathroom, and the Queen really thought that that was the wrong way to bring up children, not to let them feel guilty about their mother's own unhappiness. The two young women who had voluntarily married into the royal family enjoyed all its privileges and then turned on the system. I know that when these divorces came one after another, she did say to a close friend, well, what have we done wrong? The Queen Mother said to her, well, darling, you haven't gone wrong. It's just a different era. And it's hard for children to bring people from the outside into that very stiff world of royalty. And it still remains hard. So I don't think the Queen totally blames herself, but I think she feels, had she been around a little bit more for them, perhaps she could have been more help, but I don't think, I think perhaps they just married the wrong people. It is very difficult to be a queen and a mother. I think every important executive woman finds this. 
I think that the Windsor temperament, which has been handed down from King George V and Queen Mary, has also been a factor. Um, the stiff upper lip, the um, sweeping problems under the carpet, and the lack of communication. And this also comes from living in enormous houses like Buckingham Palace, where they live quite separate lives, each with their own suite and their own servants. And so it isn't that you have a jolly get-together in front of the television. It's a different life. In 1992, the Queen's home, Windsor Castle, was severely damaged by fire. Where the finest carpets once lay, there were only charred remains. The government asked the Queen to pay for rebuilding and restoration. Coming on the heels of her family's other catastrophes, the Queen alluded to her sadness in a speech at the Guildhall. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> in the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. I suspect that I'm not alone in thinking it so. It couldn't have been worse, could it? All the children's marriages going wrong one after another, the tremendous scandals in the papers, and the constant attention to the royal families and private lives, and then the outspoken criticism of her which she wasn't used to. She'd been used to nothing but kindness all her life. And when the public turned on her at the time of the um, winds of fire and said, no, we won't pay, I think she was deeply hurt and surprised by this. On duty again for the Second World War anniversary celebrations, the Queen is dignified in the company of other statesmen. I can do it, she says, because I have been properly trained for the job. She has been doing it for a very long time. 20 years ago in Scotland, she was photographed arriving at the Braemar Games. It was the same thing 30 years before, same camera positions, almost the same people. Back in the 80s, the Queen was hoping that a new royal generation would be equipped to take over. In the event, the new blood made her task a little more difficult. Despite her natural ability to raise the image of royalty with her hands-on approach, Diana realized too that she was not the Queen's type of girl for the job. It has to be said that Diana was more interested in buying clothes than country pursuits. Did the news of her death shock her? Of course the Queen was shocked when Diana died, as was everybody else. But her concern wasn't actually for Diana or her family or her Prince Charles. It was for her grandchildren. And William and Harry were up at Balmoral, staying with the Queen in Scotland, and her whole concentration was on protecting and safeguarding those poor young children as best she could. When the Royal Standard was not flown at half-mast, the Queen narrowly escaped a major public relations disaster. She then gave orders for a flag to be put up, never happened before, and that it should fly at half-mast. I think she was out of touch. I think it was mainly because she was trying to protect the grandchildren, and I think she very nearly got it seriously wrong. At his mother's funeral, the young Prince William walked beside Prince Philip. Prince William asked his grandfather to walk in the funeral procession. It was Pr Prince William's request. And I think that Prince William is probably the sort of son Prince Philip would like to have had. I think he's very proud of him. And he likes Prince Harry's robustness. And uh, I, I think he's um, very devoted to them in his, in his way. The death of Diana will have a lasting impact. I think it probably will be looked at in the history books as the time when the monarchy radically changed 
its attitude to its past and its future. Enter Mrs. Camilla Parker Bowles, longtime friend and mistress to Prince Charles, and possibly his next wife. I don't think the Queen will ever willingly accept Camilla Parker Bowles as her daughter-in-law. I think that any marriage between Charles and Camilla gives a big problem to the House of Windsor, and that is the Queen's consideration above the happiness of her son, Charles. So I don't think that'll happen. She has seen and met Camilla once in the last, I think it's 26 years. They met for about four seconds. Camilla Parker Bowles dropped a curtsy and said, hello, ma'am, and then the Queen moved swiftly on. Since then, she has not set eyes on the lady at all. The unity of the royal family is held together by an aging generation of royals, essentially private and self-contained in their own world. Royal appearances often make headlines for the wrong reasons. Princess Margaret's health is a major concern for the Queen. She's quite strict with Margaret. When Margaret um, burned her feet in the bath a, a few years ago, which is the beginning of all her problems, the Queen would make her get out of her wheelchair and walk. She's quite strict with... I mean, she, she, she says, get on with it, it's her sister. But she's also very concerned for Margaret and, and wants to have her around her so that she can sort of lend a sisterly support. And during the unhappiness of Margaret's marriage, the Queen was always there for her, but she was kind of... They thought Margaret was a bit of a drama queen, and she wouldn't stand any nonsense from her. For all its problems, the Queen's own family, with its succeeding generation, is the guarantee of the monarchy's continuity. There won't be an abdication. That's never, ever been discussed at Buckingham Palace or anywhere else. It just doesn't enter any of their minds of an abdication. The main reason for that, there are all sorts, but the main one is that the Queen was anointed with holy oil and took a vow to continue as sovereign until she died. It was taken before God. The Queen is a deeply religious person, a practicing Christian, and when she took that vow, that was for life. That's why there won't be an abdication above all other considerations. Like most families, the Windsors have not been unscathed by the vast social changes of the last century. I think in this day, it's very difficult being a queen because you have to appear to be modern and outgoing. And yet, remember, she's been in that ivory tower since the age of 26. She's never been able to walk down the street and, and buy an apple. She doesn't even know the price of an apple. So then relating to this modern world, when you're in the ivory tower, very difficult and Really, she's often said she just wants to go and live in the country with her dogs and horses. Prince Philip once claimed that the monarchy exists not in the interest of the monarch, but in the interest of the people. This has certainly been true throughout the Queen's reign. Amidst the call for changes in the monarchy, one should not forget the extraordinary relationship which has existed between the people and its sovereign over the last 50 years and before. Who can deny that while her subjects look forward to their monarchy changing with the times, there is so much the Queen can look back on with pride.